Hi everyone, my name is Belinda Clark and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Medell. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on this very special evening. We are excited to welcome three of our newest inductees into the Medill Hall of Achievement. And we are equally excited to welcome Emily Ramshaw as our moderator. Emily, uh, also an alumna, is the CEO and co-founder of a pretty new nonprofit newsroom that focuses on gender, policy and politics, and it's getting a lot of buzz. So we're thrilled that Emily can be here to help us out tonight and take time out of her busy schedule. Emily, I will let you take it away. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a great honor to get to talk to three extraordinary women in media, and I'm going to invite them all to join me on the screen right now. Uh, Mary Dodinsky, Helene Elliott, uh, and Maudlin Hedjerica. Uh, we'd love to have you turn on your video and your audio. And while you're joining us, ladies, I'm going to read your incredible bios uh, so that our uh, audience knows exactly what they're getting. Um, first, uh, Mary Dodinsky uh, is the director of the journalism program uh, and associate professor in residence at Northwestern University in Qatar. A longtime editor and reporter, uh, Dodinsky was the first woman to be named managing editor of the Chicago Sun-Times. There's a big Chicago Sun-Times contingent here. We're going to learn a little more about that soon. Uh, at the Sun-Times, she was also an education reporter, investigative reporter, Reporter, editorial writer, a metropolitan editor, and director of editorial operations. For her work at the Sun-Times, she was elected to the Chicago Journalism Hall of Fame, and she has twice served as a Pulitzer Prize juror. Helene Elliott was the first female journalist to be honored by the Hall of Fame as a major professional North American sport, uh, of a major professional North American sport, when she was given the Elmer Ferguson Award by the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2005. She began her career also at the Chicago Sun-Times and later went to Newsday before joining the Los Angeles Times. That's where she has worked since 1989. She has covered 16 Olympics, as well as countless Stanley Cup finals, um, in addition to covering the World Series, men's and women's World Cup soccer tournaments, the NBA finals, the Super Bowl, and other events. So welcome, Helene. And finally, last but certainly not least, Maudlin Hedjerica is an award-winning Chicago Sun-Times urban affairs columnist and reporter with 30 years of experience in journalism, public relations, and government. Recently named among the Power 25, an annual ranking of the 25 most powerful women in Chicago journalism, she earned a BA in journalism from the University of Iowa uh, before attending Medill. She currently writes the Sun-Times Chicago Chronicles, which are long form columns on people and places that make Chicago tick. She's the author of Escape from Nigeria, a memoir of faith, love, and war, which is a tale of her family's survival of the brutal Nigerian Biafran war and miracles that brought them to the United States. So uh, please join me in welcoming these incredible women. Thank you for being here and congratulations on this honor to all three of you. Thank you. Uh, so let's start off by getting to know the three of you a little bit better. Um, while your career paths and your jobs in journalism have been very distinct, obviously one common thread in addition to the Sun-Times <laughs> is the <laughs> Medill experience. Um, briefly, I was hoping that each of you could talk a little bit about what you envisioned your career would look like when you left Medill um, and what inspired you to take the paths that you took. And uh, maybe Maudlin, we'll start with you. Thank you so very much. It's um, Medill was... Um, just for me, the place where I, I solidified my, my vision that I would work for newspapers. I, after obtaining my bachelor's in journalism, I, I knew that I wanted to attend the nation's number one journalism school to obtain a graduate degree. And it was there that I, I, I learn from the best and some of the courses that I took. Um, the, the writing was the big thing for me. And um, it was during the one year program that I took um, a semester out and um, uh, did an internship at the Chicago Sun-Times where I met the great Mary Dodinsky and um, she um, oversaw um, all of the um, interns that year. And, and I worked very closely with Mary. And so then I went back to Medill and I knew after that summer at the Sun-Times, newspapers was in my blood. I knew I wanted to work in newspapers and I specifically knew I wanted to work at the Sun-Times. So um, yeah, that's, that's what Medill meant for me. 
Well, Mary, you got a name dropped there. So why don't you share uh, your own experience uh, from, from Medill yeah. on? I'm well, happy to. Um, I just want to say I'm very honored to be with uh, all three of you. Um, Maudlin, I will say by your students, you are taught. Maudlin is so much younger than I am and look at the great things she's doing. I can't wait to read your book. Uh, Helene and I, of course, crossed uh, paths when you were starting in the sports department and I was in news. And Emily, I taught you at Medill. So I'm, I'm just really honored to be with all of you women who are breaking all kinds of barriers and have, and you continue to. And I learned from all of you. So I'm, I'm just really um, honored to be here with you all. So when I went to Medill, uh, I wanted, I had two things I wanted to do in life. I was the editor of the high school paper, but I also was a singer and I was a sort of a big cheese in a small area, Milwaukee. And I did get into the music school at Northwestern, but as I was getting ready to um, decide between Medill and uh, the, the music school, I heard a woman my age sing and I thought I had died and gone to heaven and I knew I was never ever going to have that kind of an instrument. Also, I think I did have, as Mama was talking about DNA, I had the newspaper, the news DNA in my blood and I really, really wanted to go and learn about how you tell stories and how you investigate things and how you help people. And so it was a natural for me. Now, when I went to Medill, we still had the Medill F. Oh, and that scared. <laughs> and then also my Medill journey was uh, really helped by a, a early feminist. Her name was Dr. Yamashita. And she was an Australian who had married a, um, a Japanese man. And she was the one who contacted editors at the, um, that at that time it was the Tribune in Chicago today. And she greased the skids for me to get a job right out of Medill. And she was a feminist, but she had a lot of, I mean, it was tough, it was tough. So that's that's how I got to where I am. <laughs> great, great story. Helene, you're up. Well, for me, Medill was kind of a place where I hoped to find out if I could do uh, follow the profession that I wanted to. I mean, when I was in high school and our gardens counselor asked, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be a sports writer. She laughed at me. And oh. I was kind of surprised at what, what, why? She goes, well, women can't be sports writers. Pick something you can reasonably expect to do. And I was really taken aback because I had never heard anybody be so discouraging. Um, you know, people would kind of go, oh, yeah, sports writer. Okay, yeah. But I mean, to somebody in a position of authority to say that, um, I was just very taken aback. And um, I just kind of s silently promised myself that I was going to do everything I could to try and make this come true. And Medill was the place that allowed me to make that happen. Uh, I worked at the Daily Northwestern. Um, with Northwestern being a Big Ten school, the Chicago papers would come and cover football and basketball games. I got to meet a lot of the Chicago sports writers. Um, I got to uh, read the Chicago papers. And at that time, as Mary mentioned, there was Chicago Today, there was Daily News. I mean, it was, a, it was an incredible newspaper town. Um, and it isn't, there aren't any newspaper towns really anymore, sad to say, but um, Medill was a wonderful place to learn and grow. Uh, ben Baldwin was one of the people, I don't know, old time Medill people might uh, recognize his name. Frank Meyer was one of my teachers. He was an instructor, uh, worked for Newsweek. I'll always remember him and be grateful to him for his encouragement. But Medill was really the place where I launched my dream. That's amazing. Well, you know, sort of pivoting off of that um, story, you launched your careers, all three of you in the 70s and 80s. I want to talk a little bit about what the climate was like when you first started out and sort of how you've seen opportunities for women in media evolve over the course of your careers. Um, Helene, let's let's start with you, you know, since you touched on this as a woman who chose sports journalism, you know, it's, it's still a primarily male dominated uh, field. Are there any particular stories or anecdotes from the course of your career where that would really sort of illuminate what it was like then versus now? 
how many hours do we have? <laughs> Give me the juiciest story. <laughs> well, just, um, well, I mean, I started working at the Sun-Times uh, while I was still in uh, college and um, eventually was hired full-time. But um, one of my duties was to answer the phone. So I'd pick up the phone and say, uh, hello, Sun-Times Sports. Then there'd be a silence. And at the other end, the voice would say, let me speak to somebody who knows something. <laughs> because a woman couldn't possibly know anything, right? Um, I mean, just time and time again, just, uh, you know, not being allowed into locker rooms, uh, being pushed so far out of the, I remember I was locked out of the Notre Dame football stadium because they were so intent on keeping me away from the locker and they literally pushed me outside the gate. Um, you know, just little, and uh, just being told, no, you can't, you can't, you can't, and uh, not always having uh, as people as supportive as I hoped they would be. Uh, but there were some people who were supportive and who fought for me. And, um, you know, certainly things are infinitely better now. Um, there were some few female sports writers when I started that we all knew each other and we would trade information. We would say, you know, such and such a clubhouse is uh, gonna be nasty. It's gonna be tough for you. They're gonna harass you. Or, you know, such and such a player will always help you so you can go and talk to him and not worry. Um, so we, it's it's changed uh, incredibly. Um, it's um, almost impossible to imagine going to a sporting event now and not seeing a female reporter, either print or website or TV reporter. And uh, that's an incredible change. Helene, what about you? I, I, you know, obviously this is a little different in the sports world, but I'm sure uh, both you and Mary have had experiences uh, then and now uh, as women uh, in this field. I'm sorry, was you asking me? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Helene. I was looking at Maudlin. Yeah, Maudlin. yeah. <laughs> I thought you, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I think the, the main difference is that when I um, got hired at the Sun-Times in 1987, um, there was, it was very rare for a, a woman to be um, a political reporter. Um, the political beat was the top beat um, at any newspaper. And um, I remember that, um, uh, you know, the, the whole, struggle of some of the, the iconic women who have held that beat, held that role at the Sun-Times. I remember the struggles they went through um, and it would be shared with other women. Um, Fran Spielman, you know, she, she clawed her way to the top, you know, and, and, and it wasn't always, today her name is synonymous with City Hall, but it wasn't always easy. Um, the same with uh, Lynn Sweet, another iconic name from the Sun-Times. And uh, she clawed her way to the top, you know. Today, her name is synonymous with Washington, but it wasn't always, you know. She, when she went, when she moved her way, worked her way up to the Washington bureau, she, it was, it was male dominated, and and she was seen as, you know, you know, this, this, um, what's the word I'm looking for, <laughs> you know, this uh, intruder, so to speak, you know, um, and very much dismissed. So I will say that, uh, yeah, things have come a long, long way. Today, some of my um, uh, biggest role models um, on the political beat um, nationwide are women. And they are, they are carrying the torch and they are doing it better than any man. So that's, that, that's the main difference that I can recall. Wonderful. What about you, Mary? Uh, what do you want me to focus on? The difference between now and then, or uh, just uh... No, no. what was it like starting out as a woman in journalism in the seventies and eighties? Did you feel like you yeah. were held back or given, you know, fewer opportunities? Well, there were four newspapers when I started in Chicago, and it was a great competitive area. I mean, you just could feel the pulse every morning of news coming in everywhere, and I was. Uh, uh, I was probably one of four women uh, in the city room of Chicago today out of about 120 people. There might have been six women at the time. But the way I got in was I was hired to do features. And features was okay. I was um, a good writer, but I really loved hard news. And what happened was there was a teacher strike. There were uh, 500,000 students without, um, were on the streets, 25,000 teachers um, were, I mean, 500,000 students without going to school, 25,000 teachers on the street. And they needed somebody because Chicago today 
the two afternoon papers already were beginning to hemorrhage with not as much advertising. And so my break came in part because of the change in the revenue and economics of newspapers way back then. People were worried about their jobs way back then. So they put me on the Chicago teachers strike and it was great. But I remember walking into the newsroom and I heard, I saw the bank of uh, poor rewrite men and they, I heard one of them say, watch this, this chick, she probably doesn't even know where City Hall is. Well, I did know where City Hall was because I was <laughs> by the best of the deal and they said, you go and make sure you walked wherever, whatever you might be covering. And so I did know. And it turned out that these guys actually trained me well. One of them took me to all of the different beats, introduced me, I was gonna be the new um, education writer. And then, I mean, I worked, I, I worked day and night. Um, you know, this is cruel and unusual for me to be up at uh, quarter after two in the morning here, but on <laughs> that time of day. Yeah, night. right, day and night. And I made some great sources and I got some great scoops. And that's when people in the newsroom began to open up and be, but I did have people, I have to say, they were um, not the most welcoming, but they actually were very professional with me. And that happened then when I moved over to the Sun-Times, there was a, I had mentors. And I remember one summer where, Maudlin, this was before you were there, but I remember one summer when uh, uh, Jim Hogue, who was called the Golden Jet because he was such an inspirational editor, and also very good looking and he'd stride through the newsroom and you know we'd all get excited about what new project is he going to come up with but uh, he was having young people come and write editorials and the editor of the editorial page Cecil Neff walked out into the newsroom one day and he said I don't see your name on there to write editorials this summer I don't even know about it I said well we've got somebody coming from uh, Harvard and somebody coming from Yale and uh, you know, they're all men. And uh, why don't you at least try? That was a mentor and I listened and I did. But that was somebody who kind of was, and, and throughout my career, because the editors were mainly men, I did have people who helped me. So um, that was great. But throughout my whole career, it's been um, newspapers either dying or combining. So Chicago Today combined with the Tribune, then the Daily News combined with the Sun-Times, people were losing their jobs. And it's um, always been a bit perilous, but boy, uh, those newsrooms were fun. And the first newsroom was sort of like out of the front page. I'm typing away and the uh, reporter next to me falls off his chair and he's very well dressed, but he falls off his chair and I run up to the city desk and I said, um, you know, he, he just fell off his chair and city editor looks and says, oh yeah, yeah, he's, um, that's okay, don't worry about it. Because he had been out all night drinking, but he was still there dressed up to cover his story. <laughs> and so those things changed, it became much, much more professional. But it was very colorful, it was very, very colorful. And I was probably one of the first who were college trained. So I walked into these newsrooms and all these guys looked and thought, you know, so she's got a college degree, who does she think she is? But they didn't really treat me that way. They, they kind of realized that um, I wanted to, I respected and loved what they were doing. And so they, they helped me out. Well, I've heard lots of stories about those uh, glory days because my parents actually met at Chicago today. So that's, right. oh. <laughs> that's, that's speaking of having it in your DNA. Um, <laughs> Maudlin, back in, in 2018, you wrote a really heartfelt message to Sun-Times readers um, that shared how your love of journalism stemmed really from reading the Sunday paper with your father as a little girl. In that message, you also talked about your efforts to spotlight Chicago's black and brown communities in your Chicago Chronicles columns um, and the importance really of diverse narratives, which has become even more critical in American media. How do you find the people and the places and the issues covered in your column to really ensure that you're reflecting the diversity of the audience you're seeking to serve? You know, um, the, the column, the directive that I was given by, um, again, a, we were speaking of mentors and mentors are so important along the way, um, but uh, a former editor in chief of the Sun-Times, Jim Kirk, 
um, he was the one who, you know, came to me and, and offered me the opportunity to launch the Chicago Chronicles column. And, um, you know, and, and, and the directive I was given was, you know, we're in this newspapers and, and media across the country in general are in this place where we're, we're finding that, you know, we, we're bleeding um, readership because of so many reasons, but um, one of them being that um, readers now with so many options um, are able to walk away if you don't reflect them. And if you are not providing them with, um, with what they feel is important, or if uh, you are not uh, meeting their standards in terms of diversity, uh, et cetera. And so one of the things that we heard constantly was that uh, the news media is, um, is, is, is very, um, is very, um, is, is widely known for um, portraying communities of color only in crime stories or in negative stories. And we heard that over and over and over. And um, while that had been a criticism over the years, now with the influx of social media and citizen journalism, um, they were able to walk away from us if they weren't seeing themselves. And so um, my uh, editor said, you know, let's 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 address that. Let's let's launch a column that will um, find those positive stories, those untold stories in these communities of color, and 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 highlight people, places, and issues that we don't normally cover. And so, how do I find those stories? It it's basically going out into those communities. It's good old fashioned shoe leather. And I think that um, prior to this column, I would sometimes go out into the community, but sometimes not. I would do a lot of armchair journalism, but with this particular column, in order to find those untold stories, you actually have to go out into those communities. And what I found was I suddenly was being exposed to and learning about Chicago's 77 communities in a way I had never done before. Because to find those stories, I had to go out. They, they don't, those kind of stories don't come to you. Stories about um, individuals who are doing, who are undertaking hero heroic efforts to protect and, and, and salvage and save their communities and their youth and, um, and that are off the radar. You have, to, you have to actually walk those streets to find them. And, and it's, it's really a, a phenomenally gratifying journey because you learn so much and you see so much and you meet the most amazing people. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a return to good old fashioned shoe leather for me. Wonderful. I mean, uh, Helene, uh, like Maudlin, you spent the bulk of your career at one outlet, primarily the LA Times. How have you seen, how does this translate there? How have you seen the diversity of coverage expand uh, either in the sports department or generally by the paper? And can you speak a little to sort of the, the industry environment? You know, how, have, how, if at all, have cutbacks at the paper negatively affected the, the diversity of coverage? I think Maudlin just made a, a wonderful point um, about the fact that there are so many alternatives now for readers. If they don't see themselves in your coverage, they can go to websites, they can go to blogs, they can go to uh, a million other places where they will find themselves or they will find issues that concern them. Uh, and that's something I think the LA Times has been pretty slow to respond to. Uh, the last few years, though, I think we've made some strides in terms of um, being focused on hiring uh, Spanish-speaking journalists, uh, hiring journalists of color. We've had a terrible track record in retaining journalists of color. Uh, they've been making more effort now to seek out people uh, who are interested in, in working here and, and telling stories that need to be told, as, as Maudlin said so well. I mean, there's so many heroic efforts out there that we don't hear about. People, everyday lives that we don't hear about, we hear mostly about the bad stuff because, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Um, you know, we need to make a better effort to find out what the heart of this city and LA, like Chicago, it's a huge city, it's a huge population. And there's just so many different ethnic groups and neighborhoods that it's really hard to get your arms around it. But if you have people who can go out who are Spanish speaking in LA, you're going to have a better chance of getting the, getting the stories. If you speak, have people who speak Korean, there's a huge Korea town. 
Uh, you know, people who speak Mandarin Chinese, there's a huge um, Asian and uh, Chinese population here in LA. And I think that's something that we've come to realize, particularly the last year and a half or so during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that has been doing best for us in terms of metrics and reader interest is what they call utility journalism. Mm. And that kind of sums up, okay, this is what the situation is with getting your COVID vaccine. Here's where you get it in your neighborhood. Uh, this is what the situation is as far as um, uh, any number of things that are affecting daily lives. If you can get people to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm gonna check the LA Times on that. Maybe they stay, they read other stories, maybe you get a subscriber, but people need things that are gonna help them in their daily lives. And I think we got away from that. And I'm glad to see that we're getting back to it. News you can use. How, yeah. how, that, how has that played out in, in sports coverage of it all? Or how has, your, uh, how has your life changed professionally in, the, in this last year in particular? Oh boy, <laughs> has it changed. Um, you know, it used to be, one thing with journalism and, and you know, journalism is based on relationships, whether it's with people in city hall, as Mary said, or people uh, in neighborhoods, as Maudlin said, it's information is our currency. And you get information by developing relationships with people, by developing trust. Well, now we're not, um, sports writers aren't allowed in locker rooms now. Everything's done by Zoom. So everybody is getting the same basic interviews and the same information. You know, it used to be you'd go into the locker room or say baseball clubhouse, you'd go into the clubhouse, you're looking to talk to somebody and you see somebody else sitting there. So you start a conversation or you see two players interacting and that leads you to a, another story. You miss all that now. Um, so you're really more remote and it's really harder to get a read on personalities and, and, and get a read on, on a lot of crucial issues. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. So this one, this one, I'm going to start with Mary, but we could probably expand on it. Mary, I, I want to talk about what it's been like to work as a journalist and an educator of journalism in a country that has really rest, uh, strict restrictions on, you know, what can be published. Um, you know, what has this been like for you coming from the sort of freedom of the press, you know, United States into, into the environment that you're in now? Right, it's a very delicate balance. And uh, we were invited, Medill was invited in. I work in something called Education City. There are seven universities from the United States there. They were cherry picked for their, their excellence. So Medill and the Com School were invited to come for Northwestern. Cornell was for the medical school, uh, Georgetown for uh, diplomatic and international studies and on and on. So what we were, told because uh, we were, we said we have to teach Western journalism. That's what we believe in. And uh, Sheikha Mosa, who was the, who is the wife of the um, former emir, the father emir, who has a lot of power. He's got control of a lot of money. She said, yes, we want you to come in and teach that. Now, what I teach is what I teach in Evanston, which is you have to follow the law when you're a journalist. Um, you know, sometimes we may not always, but we teach our students that they, they have to follow the law. So we have to, uh, our students, however, are as idealistic and talk about diverse. I have students from 59 different countries. Wow. So wow. anybody who wants to hire and diversify their newsrooms, please come and see me because these students are Medill <laughs> trained and they are, I mean, they're from everywhere. And uh, it, it's, they're just amazing, amazing students and they wanna make a difference. So yes, so we cannot necessarily, there's not freedom of the press, you, there's certain things you're not gonna write about. Uh, but for instance, we have, I had students who did a big investigative project about domestic maids and it was published. And so, uh, the country does not want, it, it does want its institutions held to some kind of um, responsibility. Now, so we go where we can. And I will have to say, since I, I've been there quite, I've been there 11 years, actually. I can't believe that. I went, I started, I thought I'd be there one year. But it is such a uh, marvelous experience. And, and my students are just they're not my students, the students at NUQ are fantastic. I hope you will all, as my Wildcat colleagues, come out. <laughs> and I know Charles has been there. 
Uh, I think you have Belinda, I don't know about you, Stacy, but you all should come and you should all also hire my students as JRs <laughs> or interns. So it, um, so they are doing some very tough reporting. And also we have an alliance with the Pulitzer Center that gives them grants. We had uh, one really fine investigative series by a Pakistani student with a South Korean student and they went to South Korea and found that uh, there were marriages that were going on, Pakistanis and, and um, South Koreans, and it was an investigative piece. So they are, and we teach them what we learn, the, the basics of Madrid. Now, we do, however, also respect that they come from different backgrounds and different framings, and I learn from them all the time. Our students probably are more speak, uh, they have to speak English and write English to get into Medill in Northwestern and Cutter. But the fact of the matter is most of them speak two or three languages. Uh, they are much more aware of the world. Uh, the wonderful um, advances that we have had since the Black Lives Matter movement this um, summer they have celebrated and they have joined with it and they have reported on things in their own local areas because of it. So there's really a lot of back and forth. And um, so I think we've certainly been able to do a lot more tough stories since we were there in the beginning. And, you know, we're not there to change Cutter. It would have to be Cutter who wants to change itself, but we're showing them what can be done. And Helene, I hope you're coming to the World Cup in 2022. I'm still working on today, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, back in the day, Medill didn't do JRs that were international at all. And when I was a student, I really wanted to blend a JR with an international experience. And so I basically begged and pleaded with Medill to let me go to Costa Rica and work for a newspaper. And Mary is the one who pushed for me to be able to do it. And they let me, and then after that, it all opened up and everyone went amazing places, but it was really groundbreaking. And so Mary, you were ahead of your time. You were, it's like you were foreseeing this cutter experience. So well, you were, you were breaking ground by what you were after. So that's, as I say, really by your students, you'll be taught. And I'm, this is an example, Madeline and, and Emily. <laughs> I well, didn't have yours. Well, we're going to bring them to New York for teaching newspaper. And I thought that was exotic. That is. It was. <laughs> In just a few minutes here, we're going to open it up to the audience Q&A, and so you can drop your uh, questions in the Q&A section. I want to ask all three of you um, one final question here, and that is that the industry has changed so much over the course of your careers and is in dramatic transition, truly, as we speak. What advice would you give to Medill students today about embarking on careers in journalism? And whoever wants to jump in first can. Advice for students today in this moment in this industry? Well, um, I would say that the no matter what the technology is or may be, uh, you know, two weeks from now, we may be using a technology that doesn't exist today. The core is telling stories. The thing to remember is you're telling a story in a compelling way. The way you tell it may change, print, electronic, whatever, but the it's a human instinct, I think, to tell stories, to pass along information generation to generation, to make people care, to make people aware of things, um, not only what happened, but why it happened, how to avoid having it happen again if it's a bad thing, you know, how to make it happen again if it's a good thing. Just never forget that core is telling stories in a compelling way. Who wants to jump in next? That was a great one. Well, I I, I'll jump in. I think that um, absolutely I would second what, what Helene says, and I will um, add uh, writing uh, to that. And um, what I, I tell my mentees today is that um, the technology is changing so rapidly, but at its heart, writing will always be the basic foundation. You must know how to write. So write, write, and write some more. Even if you are not working, even if you are looking for that job, you should be writing at least a little bit every day and every week and practicing that craft. It's about how you tell stories. And if you can't tell the story through the written word, then we don't really, we will never really care how you tell it through video or photography. 
because you still need to articulate it to us in the end. And so writing is the core, work on your writing and don't underestimate the importance of writing as the foundation of journalism, no matter how much the technology changes, you must know how to write. I'm gonna play that for all my students. Thank you, seriously. <laughs> And, and I agree with both of those uh, things that Helene and Madeline have said. I would also add to be, uh, today's world, you have to learn how to also use social media. You have to know your audience. Breaking news, you can get from so many different places. You have to bring something, as you were saying, Madeline, you have to bring something of the community to the community that's distinctive. And so you have to uh, find, stories that are, are not that not everybody's going to have. You're going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to learn. I mean, there's a, a lot of really lush opportunities out there. You can be a data journalist. That wasn't even available to me. You can be somebody who really does podcasts that are powerful. I mean, the daily that's done by the New York Times, and I don't know, are you, Emily, I haven't had a chance to check if you're doing podcasts, but I bet you are. Give us time, in six months, yeah. we'll get there. <laughs> okay. I mean, podcasts and the things that you can do with TikTok and Instagram. And for instance, out here in the Middle East, I think there was a study that just came out that most of the Middle East young people have 8.5 or nine different social media channels and that's where they get most of their news. So the news comes though from places that are really the legacy places that are producing it, but it comes to them in a different way. It comes maybe sometimes through Instagram or Snapchat or YouTube. And we have to figure out how to reach those young people. I also worry about media literacy. I think that there has to be some effort in high schools to work with that, maybe even in colleges. I had my one of my own uh, good friends tell me about this article that uh, she was taking great issue with. I said, that's not an article, that's an opinion piece. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, and it was really, it was pointed up there that it was an opinion piece. So I, I would encourage students to learn all the time and be very flexible in how you tell your story, but you've got to be able to write it and you've got to be, you have to be as fair as you can. Nowadays, there are so many more voices out there and uh, never harm, especially here. We have to be very careful that when we quote people that we are not harming them because they honestly do not know what it means to have your name in the press or in the media and how they can be hurt. So journalists have a responsibility to do no harm that way. So that'd be mine. Well, we have an incredible uh, list of questions that are pouring in. So I'm going to jump into some of these and ladies, you can jump, answer any of the questions that you want. Um, here's a great question from Candy Lee, who asks, how do you feel about attention span and sort of, you know, social media wanting shorter pieces and writers and investigative reporters still wanting to write longer pieces? What's that? How do you sort of grapple with that balance? Well, I, go ahead. Go ahead, no, you go. I, I was just going to say that um, that's kind of um, the dichotomy that, uh, that, that my newspaper addresses with my column, meaning um, uh, Chicago Chronicles are front page, I mean, are full page long form pieces on people, places and issues. And so that is contrary to what we have to do throughout the rest of the paper which is you got to give it to them quick and you got to give it to them, you know, got to keep moving. Um, and real estate is shrinking due to at the shrinkage of advertising dollars. So the, um, uh, the length of stories are shrinking and, and we're forced to contend with that reduced attention span of the average reader because of social media, et cetera. But um, uh, all that to say that we still feel that there is a value and there are there is a segment of the population that still wants to delve into a story and enjoy a story that takes them on a journey um, rather than just hits them with the the, the 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 basic facts. 
And, and, and I think that there will always be room for both. There has to be room for both. Thank you. Uh, question from Karen Springen who asks, it's heartening that you all had some wonderful mentors. Actually, she says mentors and women tours, which I have never heard. What tips do you have for us so that we can be try to be great mentors too? So what are the traits in the best mentors you've had over the courses of your career? What are the sort of defining characteristics of those people? Well, I'll tell you, my mentors were tough. Uh, as I said, Dr. Yamashita really probably launched my career, but I got my first paper with her. I got an F. Wow. And, uh, she, you know, the expression, you talk turkey. She, she was kind. I knew, she, I knew that she believed in me. But she would say, you know, Mary, on this particular subject, you're just, you gotta, you gotta go deeper. You gotta get more people. You're not, you're not seeing the whole context. So she was a mentor who I trusted. I mean, don't put your trust for young people. Don't put uh, your trust in somebody who for some reason might not really care about you. But uh, Karen, I think you are probably a terrific mentor because you care about your students a, a whole lot. You listen to them. I think it's really important to listen when they're saying what, what's bothering them, why they feel they're not getting ahead, and, and try to address those things. In today's world, we're very careful to not be as tough talking as we were in my time. I mean, I, <laughs> some of the editors used to talk to me pretty, pretty uh, brusque. And uh, at that time, if you couldn't take it, uh, there was no crying in the newsroom. Uh, there's a new <laughs> No, that got you nowhere. That got you absolutely nowhere. Oh, yeah. So I think we're more careful now, but, but students are also, you've got to get them to be willing to say what, what concerns them. So I have a real conversation with them, I guess. Helene or Maudlin, anything to add to that on your best mentors? Um, yeah, you know, I, I would not be where I was, but where I am today without great mentors. And I, I, I have a deep, deep belief in mentoring and the importance of it. And I, I, I work to ensure that at any given time, I am carving out a um, portion of my time for mentoring others. Um, I do it through the uh, two organizations that I am president of both the National Association of Black Journalists Chicago chapter and the Chicago Journalists Association. And the reason I commit so much time to leading journalism organizations is because I know it is so important to extend a hand to the next generation. I had several people who extended a hand to me from the very beginning, Mary Dudinsky, I got there and, and she watched me and, and she, 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 she would say to me, I see your strength is X, Y, Z. Um, and, and she was always, always, always encouraging. And then, you know, after that, it has always been someone in, in a newsroom or someone on a beat who has been there to say, you know, you should do this, or you should think of it this way, or you should look at it this way. Or when I was banging my head up against the wall and believing that I was facing obstacles of any sort, be it race, any of the isms, racism, classism, of, uh, 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 gender um, bias, there were always mentors who would say, who would hear me out and say, well, you know, that's, po that's possible, but one thing you need to remember is that talent will always win out. So do the hard work, do the footwork, don't whine. There's no crying in newsrooms. There's no crying on the beat and, and keep pushing. You can't, you can't rest, you can't, you can't lay back and say, because of X, Y, Z, I can't do this. You have to prove X, Y, Z wrong. And because of that, only because of that is, is did I get where I am? And so it's so important to listen to the next generation, to offer them advice and support, and, and to make sure that they too understand that no obstacle, no obstacle can or has to stop them from reaching their goal. You just have to find a different way to get through it. That's great. Thank you.
Uh, here's a question from Jane Fliss, who asks, if you could go back and provide some words of wisdom to yourself when you were a student at Medill, what life learning would you offer up to your college self? Mine would be to party a little bit less, but I'm not sure. I, that, maybe I'm in the here. <laughs> I think mine would have been to party a little bit more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I remember junior year, I was so intent on getting a 4.0 and I was working uh, a board job in uh, Willard Hall and uh, also working at the Daily Northwestern setting type in the back room. Uh, and I had a 4.0 and I collapsed from exhaustion and spent spring break in the infirmary. Wow. So I kind of wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> Amazing. What about either Mary uh, or Maudlin? I didn't always have the healthiest of lifestyles. And I would say that uh, if I were starting out again today, I would somehow figure out how to get more exercise and to eat better. I was the Night City editor and oh my word, it's, it's a little bit like um, right now, at a quarter to three, I'm talking to all of you. And I, I would get home sometimes at four in the morning because we'd have a breaking news story. And then I'd sleep until noon and then I had to get back. It was not healthy. And that was in my control. I just didn't know better. Um, so I would tell young people, let's make sure you kind of balance a little bit more. Let's start it right away. Uh, I learned it a little late, but I'm trying now. <laughs> I think a lot of them, the next generation of journalists are a lot better at this than we were. I think so. I think so. Some of the kids, kids oh my god i was about to make a huge mistake call call some of these my mentees kids they would kill me but some of these young journalists my goodness their 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 mental focus their aspiration their determination at in their young in their early 20s is light years beyond where i was i didn't get serious about career aspirations until maybe I don't know, late 20s or, you know, 30, um, did I actually say, okay, this is what I want and this is where I'm going and I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for it. Some of these young journalists, they start at 21, they know what they want, they go for it. And, and they are, you see them on TV, on cable network, and they're analyzing the news in a way that I would never have even cared about <laughs> you know, at their age. So yeah, I think they're light years ahead of us. Great. Uh, a question from Roy Harris who asks, could you comment a little on the importance of keeping politicians honest uh, and maybe specific to Mary, what emphasis is Medill putting on this in its classwork these days? Ah, uh, Roy Harris was one of my colleagues and actually you were a little bit ahead of me. So I learned from you. You were also a fantastic uh, reporter at Wall Street Journal. And um, so I've watched your career blossom and, and you just wrote a, you wrote a book, uh, not just, but you were writing a book about uh, the Pulitzers. And so, um, boy, I, I'm gonna have to ponder that one a little bit. Um, it's probably interesting for you doing this in Qatar right now, thinking about how to keep politicians, yes. elected officials, right. uh, elected yes. there aren't many elected officials right. of course in Apple, but uh we do teach our students that you have to hold people who are ahead of institutions you have to hold them to be responsible so right now when covid uh vaccines are not being um given out well and it's it's not happening now they fixed it but the workers were not automatically getting as many vaccines uh, being available. And the press covered it. And so the government did respond and they're now opening, they opened to one of the uh, couple of the big um, uh, auditoriums and um, gathering centers. And so now they're, de they're dealing with that. So we try to steer them to care about informing the people so that they can live better. And um, I think it's still probably the traditional ways we learned, Roy. <laughs> there's, well, no FOIA, there's no FOIAs here, but if I were teaching right now in the United States, I would say data journalism and FOIA, go after it. Wow. Um, all right, well, we have time for one more before we turn it back over. And I'm gonna ask all three of you to answer this one. Uh, 
tell us about another woman in journalism who has made a difference in, in your life or your career. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, for me, it would be, have been probably because of when I was um, active in um, Chicago journalism it was Lois Willie. And she was um, one of the first Pulitzer Prize winners as, as a woman at the Daily News. And she was, uh, she was also a good friend of Royko's and the two of them showed you how you could cover the city and care about its inhabitants. And so because she was out there and was respected, she kind of made a, a path for us. I would also, of course, say Dr. Yamashita, who was a professor and was a feminist way, way back then and, and suffered for being a feminist as a, as, as a professor. They were both very brave. Who wants to go next, Helena Maudlin? Well, um, there weren't that many women in sports that I could look up to at that time, but there was a woman, actually, I think she died recently, Jeannie Morris was a very prominent uh, presence on Chicago TV. She was uh, certainly among the pioneers uh, among female TV sports reporters. Um, uh, somebody earlier mentioned Fran Spielman, uh, who also went to Northwestern and was a year or two ahead of me there. Um, uh, and, and she covered some sports and uh, she was one of the first uh, women I, who, who was a sports writer. Uh, when in New York at Newsday, a woman named Laurie Mifflin was working for the New York Daily News and later went on to work for the New York Times and uh, just watching the way they conducted themselves and the way that they pushed back uh, against all the people who were saying no, 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 uh, was very inspirational and very helpful. Um, I guess I would just, um, there's so many, but, but I'll just stay close to home. And um, I would have to say it's uh, Chicago Sun-Times columnist, Mary Mitchell. And um, it, it's an interesting story. She came to journalism in her 40s as a second career um, after working as a secretary for most of her life to raise her children. And, um, and so she went back to school, became a journalist, got hired at the Sun-Times, and I mentored her I, I, in her early years. I, I helped her um, uh, in, in those early years at any rate. Um, but then um, I eventually left the Sun-Times, came back to the Sun-Times many years later, and Mary had soared. Her career had soared, and she was a columnist covering uh, race issues and um, had become one of the most um, well-respected columnists in the city. And now I was uh, returning to the industry, and she and things flipped. She became my mentor. And so in the second half of my career at the Sun-Times, she, she was my mentor. Um, I left the Sun-Times for about, oh, I don't know how many years. But in the first half of my career at the Sun-Times, I mentored her. And then by the time I came back, she mentored me. And she has been my sounding board. She has been that person that has told me, you can do it. She's been that person that tells me, don't give up. She's been that person that says, I think you're not looking at it quite right. Why don't you think of it this way? But yeah, Mary Mitchell, she's, uh, she, yeah, she's, she's, she's that one. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Congratulations. It's a really, uh, it's such a pleasure for me to get to be with you all, uh, these pioneers. And look, we have Charles. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. Um, thank you all for joining us. This was a really stimulating com conversation. Um, Helene, Maudlin, Mary, you're not just trailblazers. You're amazing storytellers and so very worthy of your induction to the Hall of Achievement. Um, we actually look forward to hosting an in-person event in fall where we can gather to honor you and your careers as well then uh, at that time as well. And, and Mary, I want to offer a special shout out and thanks to you for joining us in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, that is so very kind of you. You're such a trooper. <laughs> and, and Emily, thank you for being a very skillful moderator of this event. You were fantastic. You are no doubt a future Hall of Achievement inductee, and I look forward to presiding over your induction at some time in the future, if I'm still here. Um, thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. 
We have one more Hall of Event Achievement event coming up on May 5th, featuring two more of our 2020 inductees, uh, Jeannie Caggiano and Carrie McElwain. Um, so I do hope you will look forward to that and join us for it. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us on this wonderful evening. I really appreciate it. And congratulations to the inductees. You make us all so proud uh, to be Medellians because you are such wonderful models for us. Thank you. Good night, everyone.